All right, it looks like we're recording. Excellent. So welcome to buyer process. Uh, we're going to go over, you know, start to finish. Uh, you know, where do we find them? How do we convert them? How do we close them? So, okay. so where do buyers come from? Well, yeah, for those of us that have been, been around a while, past clients are a great source. Uh, for everybody else, sphere of influence is going to be your number one. You know, we, we talked in, in our meeting, uh, office meeting today about family reunion. We talked about, uh, Tom talked about a lot of great stuff. If everything you go to in Mega Camp Family Reunion, almost every Keller Williams class, every board class uh, you'll ever go to, the, the secret sauce is your sphere of influence. Okay, it's going to be your number one source of business always. Yeah, I'm 32 year plus into this. It's always been. Um, kind of goes hand in hand with referrals. You know, referrals can come from your sphere. Referrals can come from your past clients, or your friends, um, other agents. Uh, you know, we we have a huge referral network here in Keller Williams. Um, I have about. 200 in my network, which, you know, is needs to be larger. Um, you know, but I did, I did over $10 million in referral business last year alone. So it's, it, you know, it was almost half of my business. Um, so it's definitely, you know, not something to be overlooked. Um, yeah, you know, good old fashioned lead generation, knocking on doors, open houses, cold calling, whatever your flavor is. Obviously, you know, in in these pandemic times, you know, we're kind of resorted to social media, but it is what it is. Um, you know, obviously we have open house and farming. And I put what there because most people, especially those that have been around a bit, you know, kind of like farming for buyers. How do you do that? You know, the, most people don't even think about that. I used to do it all the time. I did it very successfully. So we'll get into that here in a second. So past clients, yeah, of course, are you using command? Absolutely, you should be, uh, especially now. I mean, we can't get paid without using command. So we need to be in command. Um, how are you keeping in contact with your database? You know, especially if you're not in command. Um, you know, command, you put them on a smart plan that can be set it and forget it, or you can be, you know, really hands on, whatever you choose. Um, how often are you touching your database? You know, should be minimum on a monthly basis. Um, client events, I've never done one. Um, Ron Arnold team does it on a very high level. Uh, I've been to, to a couple of theirs and it's, it's a big old party. It's a, it's a great time. Uh, the last one he did la about a year or so ago, uh, was at a trampoline park in orange Anaheim. I think it was orange. Um, he rented out the entire trampoline park for, for the day and, I know a couple of years ago when he did it, I think it cost $5,000 to do. But from that event, I know he closed at least three deals on it. So it, it more than paid for itself. Um, obviously, you know, that's, it's a, a good check to write and, and, and not something most newer agents are going to do. And, and it's something that, you know, I would even think twice about doing, but it does work. Um, I've talked to a lot of other agents, both smaller agents and big agents that do client events. And, you know, there are a lot of work, but, you know, they're of great success. Um, so your sphere of influence, again, through command is, is every, every one of your contacts should be in command. If you don't know this already, every, uh, every contact has its own unique landing page. Uh, and you can structure, you know, the, the bones of that landing page, however you, you choose. Uh, one of the beauties of command is every piece of it virtually is customizable. So um, are you asking for the business? This is 
the biggest lost opportunity in real estate. Okay. I have, you know, as, as, as a coach, as a mentor for the last 23 years, you know, I've taught a lot of agents and the most important thing I've taught them is to ask for the business. I've watched agents do great presentations, be very gregarious, be, be very knowledgeable and let the client walk away because they're too afraid to ask for the business. One, one of my favorite stories is an agent that's no longer with us. Um, uh, he was a part-time agent, soft-spoken guy, but um, you know, I had taught him the nuts and bolts and, and he had that down pretty good. We were at an open house in Anaheim. Uh, I had stopped by the open house because you know, I, I have no life. So on the weekends, I would go out and pop into my agent's open house <laughs> just to see how they're doing. And uh, right at the beginning of the open house, they had he had a family in there that was very interested in the house. And I started talking to them and um, uh, along with them. And I, I knew just from talking to them, they were gonna buy this place. There, there was no doubt in my mind. They, they had that look. And, uh, you know, we were going back and forth. He's engaging. He wasn't just letting me take over. Um, and uh, we had a lender come in as well. And uh, so, you know, we got them to the lender, sat down there, and then people started coming in. And eventually we had to split up just to handle all the people. But I'm listening still. I'm listening to him. And I'm watching the, the couple that are at the lender's desk. And I, I see him get another family, very interested. And I also watched him watch the couple that was with the lender walk out the door. And I'm looking at him, he looks at me, he looks at them and he continues talking to the people that he was talking to. I took the person I was talking to, I said, excuse me for two minutes. I ran out the door, talked to these people in the driveway, secured an appointment for that evening to not only write an offer on that house, but to list their house too. And I watched him do that twice in one afternoon. So potentially $2 million worth of volume walk, walked out the door. And uh, as, uh, not to pat myself on the back, but had I not been there, $2 million would have walked out the door. So ask for the business. It's not easy at first. It's not easy ever, but you get used to it. Okay. Uh, believe it or not, I am an introvert. It is not easy for me to ask for the business, but I like to eat. So, yeah, and just by looking at me, you can tell I do it well. So you've got to ask for the business. There are ways to do it. You know, there, I'm a soft close kind of guy. I'm not a hard sell guy. You know, if you are, that's great too. Wh whatever works for you. So, uh, and there are other classes, um, you know, I, I, can, I can give you on how to close. Well, this is, isn't the one for that, but ask for the business. Does your sphere know you're a realtor or are you a secret agent? Yeah. Again, I talk to a lot of agents. People have been here months and they've never reached out to their sphere. I'm like, well, that's your number one source of business and you're ignoring them. Okay. I am a very big believer in never leave the house without a logo. Okay. So... Well, as you can tell, I've got a, a polo with the, my KW Commercial logo embroidered. I've got name tags. Uh, I've got t-shirts. I'm always, unless I'm in church, I'm always wearing a logo somewhere. Yeah. Uh, my biggest sphere, if you will, is the bowling world. Um, you know, as, as most people know, you know, I've been a professional bowler. I, I, you know, when times were normal, you know, I bowl every week. I'm in front of 200 people every Friday night and I'm wearing a logo. I'm a big billboard. 
and everybody in there knows what I do. And I have at least one real estate conversation every Friday. I do three to five deals a year out of the bowling center. Out of one bowling center, I'll have one night a week. So if you have a hobby like that, that's a great place to interject what you do. You know, sponsor a, a softball team. I sponsor my lender softball team. Yeah, and, and um, you know, it, you know, go go to the games. Go go to the games with a, a t-shirt on. You, you're eventually going to get business. There's no such thing as instant business, short of open house. You can get that in open house, but we'll get to there in a second. Um, referrals. Um, I'm going to kind of skip over Kelly because Kelly is getting a revamp right now. Um, we can do referrals through Kelly, but right now it's much easier to do them. Uh, through command or through a number of uh, uh, Facebook referral pages. How big is your referral database? Has anybody here even started on their referral database? I'm going to take that as a big old fat no. <laughs> so in command, there's a referral section. I'm going to recommend that you go through it and find, you know, start with the metro areas. Start with the Western states and add a couple of people per area, you know, that you're outside of where you're willing to service. So if you're not willing to go west of the 605, add a couple of LA agents, you know. Um, you know, San Diego, San Diego, I mean, we've got some agents in our market center uh, that are physically in San Diego, so that they're good people to have down there. Um, there's a, a guy uh, named Brian Garrity who, that I personally know is an excellent agent in San Diego. Uh, he's who, who I send all my San Diego referrals to, my San Diego residential referrals, San Diego commercial referrals, I'll handle myself. Um, but commercial is a, a completely different animal. So, so do, do that a, until you've covered the entire country. Um, because especially in California, people are leaving in droves. Yeah, you're good, you are definitely going to need it. Um, until you get it complete, if you do have the need for a referral uh, out of California or even within California uh, that you don't have somebody for, let me know. I likely do have somebody uh, that's a good agent and will get you paid. Uh, Facebook or whatever other social media you choose to use. I'm old. I use Facebook. Um, Facebook is, is, you know, the big giant in, in the room. Uh, so Keller Williams has partnered with Facebook. We've, uh, uh, you know, we have our, our ad campaigns that have unique algorithms that are, are very successful. But as far as referrals go, there's, of course, there, there are referral pages you can belong to. Um, you know, they're, they're very competitive, but they, they are there. Um, you know, one of the first deals I did with Keller Williams three years ago was a Facebook referral. I was, um, some of you have heard, heard me tell the story before. Um, I was toddling around on Facebook one night and, uh, a friend of mine from high school, an acquaintance of mine from high school. I mean, we weren't really friends, but we had a couple of classes together, um, I have literally not seen her since 1985. Uh, posted something. She had just got, she lived in Portland. She got, just got back from Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, fell in love with it, wanted to move there. Uh, so, yeah, I commented, you know, have, uh, have you found an agent there? Have you, you know, have you looked at property yet? No, literally just got back an hour ago. Great. Bam. Here's a link to my app. You can use it anywhere in the country. Okay, so you can start your property search right now. I don't have an Idaho license or an Oregon license, but I know great agents in both places. Do you mind if I hook you up? Oh, that'd be great, Tony. Thank you. I happen to know a good agent in Portland, so I hooked them up right away. I found an agent in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho that was a, a, a rock star, hooked them up. I got, you know, I got five thousand, well, two checks totaling about $5,000 for making an intro. That's all I did. 
So those opportunities are there. Let your, your, your network know that you're capable you know, of handling at least a, a portion of their needs all over the country. So if, if you're not doing at least one outbound referral a year, you're not trying. Good old fashioned lead gen. Notice on here, are you using EHKW command? So I'm gonna take an opportunity and make a small edit right now to my PowerPoint because EEDGE went away on last Friday. So EEDGE is gone. Um, again, we can lead gen through command. Um, we can do postcards, we can do uh, uh, Facebook, uh, social media posting, uh, a, lot, a lot of things done through campaigns in command. Get yourself very familiar with that tab. Uh, so some methods of lead gen, cold calling, door knocking, social media, open house. Um, you know, there's probably a few others I'm forgetting. If you, you know, I'm not a cold caller, I'd rather have a root canal, but if you are, that's great. Uh, it's a very low uh, conversion method of lead generation. You gotta make a lot of dials uh, just to, A, just to talk to somebody, let alone, you know, get, uh, get an actual lead or get a transaction. Door knocking, much better conversion ratio. Uh, Facebook, I, I don't have numbers, but I, I, it's gonna be similar to door knocking. Uh, open house, 15 to one. 15 leads to one transaction. I'm sorry, 15 visitors to one lead. And then whatever your, your actual lead conversion ratio is. My lead conversion ratio is actually pretty high. Um, most newer agents are closer to 50%. Open house. So obviously right now we can't do them and I'm really bummed, um, you know, because even after all these years, I still do 25 a year, okay? To me, that's free business, okay? Um, I recommend when things get back to normal, and they will, that you know, you take advantage of it. Now, where do you get open houses? Obviously, your listings, when you have them, you'll do open houses on them. Um, you know, most agents don't always have a listing, so then you kind of branch out to office listings. Um, we're, we're fortunate here. We have two, two pretty big listing agents, uh, Ron Arnold and myself. Uh, we pretty much always have listings. Ron in particular runs a much bigger listing agent than I am. Um, Ron usually has more listings than he has staff to sit open house on. So um, if you're, I think everybody here is in my coaching program. So um, what Ron does is he, he reaches out to me, or Hallie does his listing manager, every week, um, again, in normal times saying, hey, I need people to fill open houses on this property, this property, this property, these states, who you got? And I will plug and play and put people in, in an open house. I'll usually take one for myself too and bring a new agent I haven't, haven't sat open house with and use it as a training opportunity as well. Um, so, so again, one of the perks you get uh, uh, working with me. Um, short of that, other Keller Williams listings it would be the the next place I would look. Um, I do. I'm not a script person, but I do have a good text script that we developed a few years ago. That seems to work. You know, agents don't answer their phones these days. Te you know, just basically texting them, "Hey, I'm so and so. Uh, you know, would love to sit your open house this weekend." Yeah, agents are lazy. They don't mind. Um, and if it's an out of area agent, your likelihood goes way up. Um, and then other listings in the, in the MLS, just, you know, do a search where you want to sit open house and find that listing agent, give them the same script. And yeah, you, we, we figured out you get a, a response about one out of every five texts. So 
Tony, does the yeah. listing agent have to be a Keller Williams or they can be? No. no. Okay. No, for, for example, in fact, I think I was just telling you about the open, one of the last open houses I did, that was my former broker. That's Pat Owen Realty. He's a little independent guy. I can set an open house for anybody. Okay. Good question. And then we get to farming. So how in the world do you farm for buyers? Any ideas? Well, how do you farm for sellers? You pick a geographical area usually, uh, door knock, mail, make yourself present, right? So for buyers, you don't do it geographically so much as at least the way I do it is I go after renters. Okay. 84% of renters want to buy a home per NAR. Okay. So I need to find those renters that can likely afford to buy a home. So I'm not looking at people that are renting a room in somebody's house because they probably can't as a rule. I want somebody that's paying a crap ton in rent. Okay, that's just throwing money away. Those are the people I want. So I want your higher end apartments and I want non-owner occupied single family homes. Okay, a lot of people take non-owner non occupied single family and go after the seller. Well, that's a good, good tool as well but I also want to go after the buyer. So why don't these renters buy a home? Okay, three basic reasons. Okay, location, location, location. They have to be where they are for school, work, family, and they just can't afford to buy it there. Can't do a whole lot about that usually. A lot of times they may not realize they can afford to buy there, but you know, that, that's, a, that's a conversation you have to have with them. Um, second reason would be bad credit, no credit. Um, so we can actually do something about that. Maybe not today, but we can get them with a reputable credit repair person and put them on the path to rebuild their credit or, or boost their credit score uh, to get them ready to buy. My lender and I, we've, we've got a line of people that are a month, three months, six months, nine months out. Um, you know, they're either saving money or uh, repairing credit or both. Um, and when they're ready, then, you know, we get them in a the house. So um, again, it's why your lender relationship is so extremely important. Uh, the most important relationship you have as an agent. Um, and that's why I, I love my lenders so much. I've you know, worked with them my entire life. Uh, anyways, uh, and the third reason is no money. And yes, we can do something about that too. So, you know, the, la the last two uh, uh, reasons is my typical client, bad credit, no money. Um, there are, you know, there's FHA, three and a half percent down. That's not a whole lot. Uh, there's CalHAFA that can go at, to 1% down, uh, you know, so there, there are alternatives. You need a little bit of money, but if you're making enough money to buy, you should be able to save enough money to buy. And sometimes it's just having that conversation, you know, hey, stop going to the bar three days a week because that's expensive, I can tell you. Uh, and, you know, you'd be surprised how much money you have when you stop doing that stuff. So sometimes it's just simply having a budgeting conversation uh, with someone. So, um, so now once you've you've done that farming, okay. Uh, the other other piece I, I should put on there is uh, once you once you're talking to these buyers, what do you say? Okay, uh, you know. I mean, yes, are you interested in, <clears throat> excuse me, in buying a home? You know, again, most of them will say yes, but then give you an excuse. And then you address the excuse. 
put together a rent versus buy comparison. How much is it costing you to rent that home? And how much will it cost you today to buy a home and see what the difference is? And usually it's not more than a couple hundred dollars per month. Yeah, especially when you when you consider tax implications. You know, most of these people, I mean, most people are pay stub employees. Um, most of those people, you know, if we adjust their W-4, instead of getting a huge tax re refund, uh, because, uh, you know, once they buy a house, now you have a big interest deduction. We adjust their W-4, get that money every pay period, they can give themselves roughly a 20% pay increase, take-home pay increase. That makes that slightly larger payment much easier to swallow. So, so now I got a buyer, now what do I do? Well, you have your buyer interview, okay? The pre-qualification process and then show property and write an offer. Um, excuse me, my mouth is very, very dry because I talk a lot. Uh, fortunately, I have a refrigerator in my office. Um, So what do we do in the buyer interview? Now, there are people that will give you a whole checklist of what to ask and three pages and write out your dream home. Ah, no, it's not that complicated. It really isn't. I mean, you know, if, if checklists and, and all that is your thing, you know, far be it for me to, to dash your dreams, but they're not mine, <laughs> okay. I am, I am that high D on the disc, disc scale. I'm a cut the crap, get to the point kind of guy. Um, doesn't work with everybody, but that's okay. You know, I'm not, I'm not gonna get everybody. Yeah. So I like to talk to, to people. I like to talk to my clients. I like to get to know them. Um, while I probably should write some notes, I tend not to, I tend to, to keep it all in here. Um, as I get older, I really do need to write notes. <laughs> uh, but what I want to know, okay, I want to know why. What is their motivation? Okay. I mean, yes, I love it that you want to buy a house. Yes, I'm going to help you. But why do you want to buy a house? Why do you want to buy a house there? What, what will that do for you? I'm not asking these questions verbatim, but it's what I want to know. And I'm going to find out just in conversation. Okay. So you'll take classes, especially in family reunion, that are going to tell you to ask those very questions. And I'm going to disagree. I'm going to say, yes, you want to know that, but you're going to sound like Mike Ferry if, if, if you ask those questions just like that. And I'm not Mike Ferry and I never want to be. So, uh, so, so just figure out in conversation and, and if you engage them, they will tell you. Um, what do they know? What do they know about the process? And for most buyers, the first time buyers in particularly, it is jack squat. So, and, and that's actually a good thing because usually if they know something that's probably wrong <laughs> or at the very least, it's not the way I operate. So, uh, I want a buyer that knows zero. Okay, it's easier for me to manage. What do they want? Okay, that part's pretty pretty black and white. However, there is an old saying in real estate: buyers are liars, sellers are fools, and it, it's truer than than we want to think. Um, and it's not so much that buyers lie, but buyers don't know what they want. They think they know what they want. And nowadays they watch too damn much flip and flop. And that's what I want. Well, no, not really. Um, you know, I, I've, again, I've been doing this a long time. We don't see too many rock roofs these days, but uh, back when I started, I can't tell you how many times I had buyers tell me, you know, I'm pretty easy, but I absolutely don't want a house with a rock roof. Most of those people I sold homes with rock roofs too. 
Okay, and that's not because I'm an ass. <laughs> it really isn't. So some people would, would disagree, but it's because what's under the house is more important than what's over it. You know, and if because they don't live on the roof, they could they can deal with that inconvenience. Because I hate rock roofs too. I have one. <laughs> and I like to walk around barefoot and, and walking outside after a rainstorm, after a windstorm it is like walking on Legos. Okay. Uh, just not cool. But what's underneath it is much more important. Um, and a lot of times, you know, I, I've had people tell me, you know, a, a short laundry list of must haves. And after I've talked to them and I've shown them the first five houses that have all of those check marks, they hated every one. But in talking to them, I figured out what they really wanted. So that's why it's very rare a buyer will get into my car a, more than twice without me writing an offer. Extremely rare. You know, if I have to take them out uh, a third time or more, they're probably not serious. And, and they don't get in my car again after that. But uh, usually it's, it's they weren't honest with themselves as to what was important. Or it's a husband and wife that want two polar opposite things. And that's a lot of fun. <laughs> you know, then you got a real talk and, and, and figure out who wears the pants in that family and, and cater to that, unfortunately. That, I mean, that's the best way to do it. Um, importance and necessity of pre-approval. Again, I am going to go against the grain on this one. Um, Pre-approval is important, absolutely. Pre-qualification is more important. Um, they don't have to go all the way through the pre-approval process if you have a lender that knows what the hell he's doing. If you don't, then pre-approval is extremely important. Um, if you have if you're, especially if you're farming, if you're just out there talking to people, you want to get them with your lender as soon as possible. First of all, it's committing them. It, it lets you know how serious they are. Um, second, it's going to get them far enough along in the process. Now you have a price, a number that you can work with. So now I can search up to a maximum of X. Okay, here's what we got. Tell me what you like. Um, you know, I'm going to pick five. You pick five. Let's see if we pick the same five. Uh, you know, in, in better days when there's a lot of inventory. You know, here's my five. Here's your five. Now let's decide which five we're going to go see and go out. Get them in your car as soon as possible. Uh, one of my favorite bold laws. Logic makes you think. Emotion makes you act. Okay. Buying a house is an emotional process. So when they find something and they like something, do not let them go home and think about it, if at all possible, because they will talk themselves out of it. Um, so when you're talking to buyers, you don't have to be a lender, but you have to know about lending, okay? A lot of agents, especially a lot of newer agents, at least newer than me, say, no, you don't need to know a thing about lending. Just hand them to your lender. No. They're built rapport with you. They want answers from you. Now, you're not going to be able to tell them everything, and that's okay. But you need to come off as knowledgeable about the process. So you need to know what they need. And virtually every buyer is going to need these three, these four things okay, to get to a lender. And, you know, everyone's going to have its own unique characteristics. But, uh, but you actually need proof of funds, too, because you need, if you're going to write an offer, you're going to have to send proof of funds along with that offer and a prequalification letter from the lender. Uh, but get them with your lender as soon as possible. Now, there is an... And, uh, in my Underwriting 101 class, I, I go over this in great detail um, with the scenario of you're in an open house. It is four o'clock on a Sunday afternoon. You've got somebody that fell in love with house, wants to write an offer right this minute. What do you do? Now, I ask every 
seasoned agent in this office, they're going to say, hand my lender's card, go talk to him, get pre-qualified, call me back. My follow-up question would be, how's that working for you? How often do you get that phone call? Not very often. Again, logic makes you think, emotion makes you act. Emotion is making them act. Once you insert logic into it, bye-bye. Okay? Not that they're not motivated. They are. But then fear comes into it more. And, and you want to be there when fear comes into it because we're the ones that smooths the feathers. Okay? So you need to know enough about lending to prequel them yourself in a situation like that. And a lot of times, because I was an underwriter, I, I can do this. Um, you know, if, if I'm door knocking apartments, for example, and I get somebody that's interested but has no idea if they're able to and might be hedging calling my lender, I said, well, you know, do you have, you know, some of these uh, documents handy? Let me take a look at them real quick. I don't even need copies. I, I can just, you know, do a down and dirty uh, prequal on, uh, on a notepad, you know, and tell you what you qualify for. Okay, I would love for every agent of mine to be able to do that. Um, because again, you know, that puts you as the expert. Yeah. People wonder why I get phone calls, you know, years after I, I, I'm horrible at, at talking to my past clients. I mean, I, I admit it. I get phone calls years after I talk to them because they trust me because I am the expert. Uh, you know, last January, I had a come listen to call. I fired this client nine years ago and he calls me. Okay. And the buyer on that duplex was a, a client of mine. I hadn't talked to since 1996. Yeah. But they trust me. I am their realtor. I'm their realtor for life. And touches like this is what makes that happen. So, so definitely take take underwriting 101 uh, as well. So the pre-approval process is going to look like this. Again, ideally you get them to your lender rather than do it yourself, but in a pinch, you know, again, I'll teach you how to do it yourself. Uh, they'll do a phone interview with the lender. The lender's going to ask them what they do, how long they've been doing it, how much they make, et cetera. Uh, he's going to ask them for this documentation down here, pay stubs, tax returns, bank statements, source of funds. Okay, uh, he's going to take all of that, grind out some debt ratios, and, and figure out you know what uh, what price range they can afford. He's going to look at the best financing options. So I use a mortgage broker. Okay, uh, I'm not a big fan of institutional lenders, B of A, Wells Chase, they suck. Um, they're slow. Uh, you know, they will, they'll offer you the best rates in town, but they can't get out of their own way, unfortunately. I know I worked for B of A for 10 years. So avoid them whenever possible. I've had clients come to me with pre-approval in hand from institutional lenders. I do everything I can, as Yvette well knows, <laughs> to, to tell them, run, do not do this, okay? And um, you know, the, I mean, they, they, are, they are who they are, you know? And, and because a lot of people don't know better, they, you know, they have their entire banking relationship with one bank. They offer loans. Hey, I'm going to go to that bank. And a million years ago, that was very common. I mean, they were the biggest source of home lending, you know, in the country. Um, old, uh, well, it's now Chase, but old Washington Mutual was, at one time was the biggest mortgage lender in the country. Yeah. Uh, was taken over by Country Ride, which was... Uh, a big old fiasco that, that B of A bought and, and almost took down the largest bank in the country. But that's a completely different story. So a broker, so where I was going with this was uh, an institutional lender has one program. 
They only have what they have. That's it. A broker deals with 50, sometimes 100 different lenders that have various programs. So they could be dealing with, you know, several hundred options. They're going to look at the best option for that particular scenario. And sometimes they'll have three or four uh, that are, you know, pretty close, pretty equal. The lender will follow up with you if you, again, if he's, if he's a good lender and then issue a pre-approval or pre-qualification letter. Uh, and then, you know, once, uh, once the lender, the, the broker blesses it at that point, boom, get them out there and, and, uh, and look at property. Some lenders and some agents, uh, listing agents ask for a DU or an LP. And what that is, a DU means direct un underwriting and LP means loan pre-approval. LP isn't used very often, so I can't remember what that is. Uh, but for about the last 10, 15 years, um, anything that's Fannie and Freddie uses this process, it's an automated uh, system generated pre-approval uh, pre or approval uh, based on you know, the information that the, the broker puts in. Um, if you have one up front, it could make for a stronger offer. Um, especially in, in, in this highly competitive market. Um, myself, I don't use them. Uh, my, my broker has been doing this again for 40 years. Uh, so he doesn't use them. Most brokers that use them, use them because they don't know what it's going to take to get them approved. You know, my guy's been doing this for a while. He knows what he can do and what he can't do. So, uh, so he actually does this at the absolute end. The only time he does it early is when, you know, I'm, I'm writing an offer and the listing agent is insisting on it. Then he'll go, go get one done. But it's ultimately, it's not a necessity. Uh, blank page, or is my computer freezing? Okay, offer checklist, I think my computer's just going slow. So, Fast forward a little bit, we, we, we've now gotten them pre-qualified, we've shown them property, and now we're writing an offer. They found what they love, let's go get it. So we need the pre-qualification letter from the lender. It's gonna state, you know, hey, I've got, I, I've looked at this package, these people are good for this program up to this amount. Um, and that letter's gonna, should always match the amount that you're writing. You know, I don't, I don't want to tell somebody that my people are good for six hundred thousand, and I'm writing five fifty. Yeah, because I, I, I it, it takes some of my negotiating power away. Uh, we want proof of funds wherever that down payment's coming from, four hundred one k bank statements. You know, the only thing that's not acceptable is cash in the mattress. Okay, and there's ways around that though. Um, uh, the RPA package. Uh, so in, in zip forms, you know, there's a, a few forms that go along with the actual RPA. I do contracts once a month. Uh, we'll show you how to do that. I believe the third week of this month. Um, if you have copy of FICO's, great, send them. Some listing agents want them. Most don't ask for them, but um, if they're really high, by all means, send them. Uh, seller contribution. So not in this market, but historically, you know, I, I've been pretty good about getting the seller to pay for some of the buyer's closing costs. Uh, in, in a balanced market, even in a slight seller's market, I can get 5,000 or so from the seller. Um, not in this market, but uh, but don't be afraid to ask, especially if your client needs the help. But again, not in this market. Uh, and, and that contribution will go on the RPA. So 
fast forward, we wrote a great offer. We got it accepted by some strange miracle. And the next step is we begin both the loan process and the escrow process. So the listing agent is going to open escrow. They're going to forward the RPA over to escrow and we will get an email from the escrow, just a welcome type email. Uh, you know, this is me. Where do you want, you know, how do you want me to communicate with your buyer? Where do I send the uh, wiring instructions for the deposit? Okay. Some escrows will insist on sending the wire instructions directly to the buyer. Others don't mind sending them to me. Personally, I prefer all communications to the buyer to come through me. I am a bit of a control freak. Uh, if something goes south, I want it to be because of me. You know, I'll, I'll shoulder the responsibility. That's okay. Um, but again, I the vast majority of escrows are not very good. So I want to be able to manage the flow of communications because I want it to be pretty transparent to my client, okay, if things aren't going as well as, as they should be. I tell my, my, virtually all my clients the same thing. You can sweat when you see me sweat, <laughs> you know? I know escrow officers aren't too bright, the majority of them. I know escrow officers are very overworked, all of them, okay? Um, things happen, things get, you know, slip through the cracks, Okay, I get it. It's okay. As long as they tell me, I'm fine with it. If they lie to me, that's where I get angry. Um, but again, I, that's with the escrow. You know, with my client, you know, I, I, I can let them know what, what's going on, um, you know, and where we're at. So uh, again, always funnel through me. Documents, communications, all through me. Uh, so Within the first uh, 24 to 48 hours, buyer's gonna deposit the uh, earnest money deposit into escrow, usually via wire. They can do it other ways, but these days it's, it's pretty much via wire. Um, and then we as buyer's agent will send the RPA and any counter offers to the lender so the lender can start. The next step is, is and a step I actually omitted from here, uh, we need to get the home inspection done, okay? I like to do that within the first 72 hours. I wanna know what's going on there uh, quick, okay? And then about that time, you know, by that time we should have escrow instructions from escrow and hopefully the initial disclosures uh, from the listing agent. On the loan side, uh, the lender is going to send some initial disclosures uh, to the buyer. Uh, loan disclosures, loan estimate. Usually the numbers are, are very off, uh, but that was a long explanation uh, about that. Uh, then once that is done and uh, then the lender can order the appraisal the buyer, it's one of the few uh, out-of-pocket expenses the buyer pays up front and not through escrow. They're gonna pay for the appraisal uh, via credit card and they're gonna pay for the home inspection, uh, you know, cash or check usually. Um, I'm sure some of the larger inspection companies take credit cards. Um, I don't use the big companies, so I, I, I use a, a, an individual. So once that happens, uh, you know, appraisal comes back, the loan is processed, we're getting in and uh, the lender's getting any straggling documentation that they may need. Always, always, always updated bank statements, updated pay stubs. So if, if, if you're, your client's a pay stub employee, tell them save their pay stubs and save their bank statements through the entire escrow process. As soon as they get one, send them to the lender because they will ask for them every single time. Uh, then once the loan is submitted for approval, uh, it's approved and there's 
always some conditions to the approval. Uh, most of them are minor that as agents we don't get involved with. The lender usually has those under control. Uh, they, they might get it from escrow, they might get something from title, things like that. But every now and then it might be an updated pay stub or something like that too. So uh, there, there's prior to loan doc conditions, there's prior to funding and prior to closing conditions. So hopefully everything is not prior to loan doc conditions. Then um, once all that's set, the final LE is sent to the borrower, that's a loan estimate. Then uh, the final CD is sent, that's a closing disclosure. There is now a mandatory three-day wait since 2015. Uh, and then loan documents can be ordered. Right about that time, by the way, we want to do the final walkthrough um, uh, on the property. Just make sure any repairs have been done, the property's in substantially the same, same shape. Um, then, you know, by that point in time, our file should be complete. Uh, loan will fund, deed will record, you know, if it's LA County, it'll record the next day. Uh, other counties can do same day uh, recordings. And that's the end of the loan process. Once the deed records, escrow is closed. And then depending on what we negotiated for possession, then you can give the buyer the keys. So, you know, customarily, uh, if it's owner occupied, you know, we give the seller three days uh, to move. So I, I don't give my clients keys before the seller's out because I've done it in the past and it's been problematic. So let's talk loans a little bit. We got a few minutes. Um, one of my personal favorites, FHA. Uh, everyone is eligible. Uh, it is, is uh, this is a government loan. The government insures this loan. So you can get an FHA loan from any bank uh, or mortgage broker, et cetera, okay? Uh, there's always mortgage insurance on it, no matter what the down payment. You can do a 50% down FHA and there's, you're still paying mortgage insurance, okay? Um, there is up, there's two mortgage insurance premiums. There's upfront MIP, which is one and three quarters percent of the loan. And it's, it can be paid in cash, but it's almost always added onto the loan. So that's very important when you're doing net sheets uh, for a buyer to remember that. And then there's, of course, the monthly MIP on the payment. Um, it's a minimum 3.5% down. Uh, so it's one of the lowest down payments you, you can find. Uh, the qualifying guidelines are very, very easy. Uh, you can go as low as a 550 FICO score. And my lender actually has an investor that will do FHA as low as 500. So if you go under 580, I believe, you have to have 10% down. But again, you can still do FHA. The rates right now are lower than conventional by about a quarter percent. Usually they're a quarter percent higher. Uh, and higher debt ratios are allowed. Um, the, we've gotten through as high as 59% on the back end. That's extremely high. So uh, it's, FHA guidelines are very loosey-goosey. So who's your FHA buyer? Bad credit, no money, low FICOs, oftentimes a first-time oftentimes a first-time buyer. A lot of people come to me, hey, you know, what's your best first time buyer program? Okay. And usually I'm going to tell them FHA. Yeah. You know, there are some city sponsored programs that are for first time buyers where they, you know, they might give them a little money to buy, buy a house, but they've got to jump through a lot of hoops and it's usually not worth it. Sometimes it is though. Uh, but again, those are, are normally for conventional loans, which they might not always qualify for. A lot of first-time buyers are coming in on a shoestring. So FHA is a good program for that. Uh, so VA. Um, oddly enough, I have not done that many VA loans. Um, 
yet they're an easy loan to do. Um, so there is the infamous VA no-no, no down payment, no closing costs. That one is very hard to get through these days because again, sellers don't want to pay for a buyer's closing costs. Uh, but there's never a down payment required with VA. So, uh, so in order to, to get a VA loan, it's only for eligible veterans, not all veterans. Uh, it must have, have an honorable discharge. You must have the DD-214, which is your proof of eligibility. Okay, if you have that, you can get a VA loan. There's never mortgage insurance. Uh, there is a 2% funding fee uh, that can be paid in cash or tacked onto the loan. Uh, again, no minimum down, easy qualifying guidelines, similar to VA, or similar to FHA though. Uh, they do both a debt ratio and they do a funky, uh, oh, what's, what's the word? Uh, residual income analysis that I actually don't even know how to do. One of the few lending items I have no idea how to, how to approach. Um, but it, it's pretty easy. And I, I did one last year. Uh, client had a back end ratio of 65%, and they still did it. So, uh, and they'll do as low as 580 FICO. The rates right now are the same as FHA. Um, and like I said, the debt ratio plus residual analysis. So, um, and, you know, any, any mortgage broker can do VA. Um, so again, who's your VA buyer? A vet with little cash, maybe a little credit challenged. Um, so, you know, again, a much narrower piece of the pie. Uh, conventional. So again, everyone is eligible. There is no upfront PMI. You will only pay mortgage insurance on any loan to value over 80%. So if you're coming in with less than 20% down, you will have MI. There are programs as low as 3% down. Back in 2015 or 2016, um, Fannie and Freddie you know, noticed that a lot of condo complexes were not renewing their FHA certifications. Uh, and you know, a lot of condos get sold FHA because again, first time buyers, that's usually uh, is, is your FHA buyer. So in order to help bridge that gap, uh, Fannie Freddie came, came in with a 3% down conventional. The only difference on that is you need a 720 FICO for that 3% down. So, you know, great in theory, not so great in practice. So usually uh, for, for most of us normal folk, you need at least 5% to go uh, conventional. Uh, you can do that with as low as a 620 FICO. The rates are about a quarter percent higher than government, um, but they have a hard 45% back end debt ratio cap. They will not go over 45%. Yeah, remember your back end is all of your debt, is your more, your projected mortgage debt and all of your other debt off of your credit bureau divided by your gross income. So again, a lot of times we go FHA just because of the debt ratio. They may have great credit, great, uh, you know, great stability, but they owe a lot of money. So who's your conventional buyer? Someone with a little more cash, someone a little more established usually. Um, and a, a lot of times it's a, it's a repeat buyer, somebody buying up. So what else is out there? Uh, if you were in the meeting, you heard uh, Renee, uh, our in-house lender, uh, talk a little bit about non-QM loans. Uh, she didn't really explain what they are. Stated income, non-QM is, is in short, funky loans, <laughs> okay? Anything that's not Fannie and Freddie, not conventional, not government. Uh, stated income right now is the most uh, most common. There's bank statement loans. There's all kinds of stuff. My my lender and I will both tell you that anybody, and I mean anybody, can get a loan. 
The question is how much are they willing to pay for a loan, okay? So, because not everybody's going to get that sweet, easy, conventional or FHA loan. Some people need a stated income product, okay? I, I, I'm doing one right now, great stated income product with uh, uh, 30% down, you know, I think the minimum is 25, um, you know, but it's 4.9% it's 30 year fixed, not a horrible loan. Um, yeah, and, and there's no income verification. It's just appraisal done. So uh, those kind of loans, again, I mostly are for self-employed or, or people unable to document their income. The, I'm not talking about ITIN programs or things like that, but uh, you know, for those of us that are self-employed, most of us, you know, deduct everything we possibly can and a few things we probably shouldn't. So we're not showing uh, a lot of income. Um, and again, rates are going to be higher. There's there's hard money. I think it might go on there next. Yep, private money. Um, again, those will likely be for, for some lower FICOs, unable to qualify for Fannie Freddie normal loans. Uh, anywhere from 25 to 30 percent down required high rate short term you know th this is, is hard money uh, I did one this summer uh, 9.9 percent .9 interest only you know for a two-year term and uh, she was charged three points for the for the pleasure of doing it so uh, but it was all she had uh, all she could do right now and, and uh, she was going to be able to refi refinance out in like six or nine months. In fact, I think they just completed the refi. Um, so, you know, th those are, they're possible, they're band-aids is what they are. Um, so perspective on the market, again, even in bad times, people always need to buy or sell. Right now, hey, the market market's gangbusters, but this this too will pass one day. It's not gonna be this way forever. Markets always shift over time. The real estate market has a cyclical nature. Um, so, so don't be concerned when the market does shift downwards because it will. Um, there's a lot that goes into affordability and availability. Won't get, won't get too deep into the weeds here, um, but Everybody I talk to, and, and Stephen Thomas will uh, uh, go over it in greater detail on Friday. Uh, that's on the training calendar also, and I highly recommend uh, you go to that class. Um, I, Stephen Thomas is one of the few people I listen to as, as far as uh, uh, market numbers and market forecasting. Uh, incredibly smart man. Um, everybody's expecting this year to be very similar to last year. Uh, hopefully with a little bit more inventory. God, I hope so. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, there's still gonna be a, a, a net migration out of California, uh, you know, until California changes its ways. That's just the way it's gonna be. Um, but that's, and that's good news for us. Um, after this year, you know, Hard, hard to go too far ahead. My personal opinion is, you know, 2022, we're going to see pretty flat. A lot of it is going to depend on, you know, what happens in the next two weeks, especially today. Um, you know, it's going to have a, a large effect on, on our country and, and ultimately our economy. Real estate drives a lot of our economy, though. So as long as people, you know, have jobs, they will buy and sell property. You know, there's no other, no bigger part of the economy that creates as much wealth as real estate does. You know, so that part's important, and, and that part is awesome that we have that kind of impact, uh, you know, on people's lives and 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 on the world and on the economy. So, um, at that point, we we're actually about ten minutes early. Any questions on anything I went over? No, I think that's good. Good, good. I try to be complete. Uh, so this uh, this class is has been recorded um, and will be posted 
as soon as Justina posts it, I have no idea what her schedule is, uh, but soon, so, so you can always go back and, uh, and, and see this over again, because the process rarely changes. And if it does, of course, I'll just record a new class. Uh, so I am going to stop recording now. Okay. And...